They fought a holy war to fulfill a prophecy. As the Israelites were freed, so would they be freed eventually. From the ashes, they forged a powerful faith that sustained them through brutality and betrayal. Am I not a man because I happen to be of a darker hue? It gave birth to a vision of equality. Why should not we believe that God is a Negro? Through the battlefields of American history, a people raised their voices and asked, where can we go to be free? They carried muskets, Bibles, and faith in God's providence. Faith is the most powerful force in the world. It is the one thing, it is the one light people can't put out. You have one faith that over a period of more than 300 years that is articulating and defining itself, believing that God has made us into a people not to be slave, but to be free. Henry McNeil Turner was the first black chaplain in the Union Army. His is the story of how the black church developed. Writing weekly in the newspaper of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, he expressed the faith African Americans brought to the Civil War. God will surely speak peace when his work is accomplished. Then the millennium will dawn. Our race that has been afflicted and downtrodden shall then stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Turner's was the faith of generations that delivered. It was a chaotic time. Four million slaves freed into a war-torn economy by a president Chaplain Turner called the Jesus of Liberty. But then, on Good Friday, 1865, President Lincoln was assassinated. This nation had lived in sin all of that time, and somebody had to be crucified. Somebody had to suffer uh, for the redemption of the souls of this nation. It seemed the freedmen had been left to wander in the desert. In North Carolina, the regiment chaplain Turner served freed slaves who were then left at the mercy of their former masters as the army moved on. To describe the scene produced by our departure would be too solemn. Many of the tears shed Many sorrowful hearts bled. I was compelled to evade their sight as much as possible, to be relieved of such words as these. Chaplain, what shall I do? Where can we go? Will you come back? All his life, Turner spoke for those whose voices seemed only to be heard by God. He came from Abbeville, South Carolina, the seat of the Confederate secession, where it was illegal for blacks to learn to read. Family legend said his mother was the daughter of an African prince so he was born free. Yet he worked side by side with slaves. As an old man, he remembered two things about Abbeville, the elderly slave who taught him to pray and the white lawyers who taught him to read. You had to read and write in order to progress. And every turn there seemed to be 
an obstacle. Finally, he was embraced by some attorneys at the courthouse. Here are these, these lawyers. Now, you can say that they uh, were playing a game or something because he had such a good memory, which is one kind of reference that's really made. Or you could say that they provided enormous opportunity, not only for him to complete his kind of basic education, but to be exposed, especially to issues of public policy. The white Southern Methodist Church married public policy with faith. Turner became a Methodist preacher. By the time he was 23, his sermons drew white and black alike. Oh, gospel train them a coming, I hear just at hand. I hear them car wheels rumbling and rolling. He was a traveling evangelist who attracted large biracial crowds in the cities through the South that he traveled, and he traveled all the way as far west as New Orleans. He had quite an audience, quite a reputation, uh, even before the Civil War. But among the white Methodists, Turner could never be more than an itinerant preacher. He heard of a church where blacks could become bishops and join the African Methodist Episcopal Church. After the war, he became one of its hardest working missionaries. Turner and the other AME missionaries believed that there was a special mission, a racial mission, that the AME church was duty bound by its obligation to God to fulfill. And that obligation was to uplift the race in every conceivable way, psychically, spiritually, economically, educationally, in every conceivable way. In February 1865, the Union flag rose over Fort Sumter. Soon after, a group of missionaries flooded the South. Among them, Turner's mentor, Daniel Payne, the senior bishop of the AME Church. Payne represented Northern liberalism, education, and respectability. He intended to transform his race. It's not simply a certain kind of fastidiousness that leads people like Daniel Payne to be so concerned with reforming the lives, and in particular the religious lives, of freed people. It's also a real sense that this is a moment in which the race is on trial, in which there's an opportunity and an obligation to run black institutions according to recognized standards and thereby vindicate the capacity of the race. Alexander Payne came from a Lutheran background, which was very much a high church background where people really didn't express themselves that much in worship, uh, a more of a cerebral type of worship and environment, whereas Henry McNeil Turner believed uh, in an emotive style uh, of worship where uh, people could give full vent to their uh, emotional releases. One of his most important, I think, contributions was his emphasis upon people who are outsiders. He goes to Georgia. What's he doing? He's organizing sharecroppers. And he's also bringing them with this kind of Wesleyan message, uh, particularly as he would have it done, which is kind of sung congregationally as <laughs> such. And in that message, of course, one is hearing that God loves the poor because the poor and outsider realize that they have no place else to turn but to God. In 1866, freed blacks praised the Lord as they participated in politics for the first time. Even with the protection of occupying Union forces, freedmen needed a hand to deal with the political process turned upside down. In the early elections after the war, blacks could vote, 
but the white folk in the South couldn't, those who had been Confederates. This made it extremely difficult for blacks because all of the effort on the part of Southern whites from the time of the end of the Civil War until the 1930s and 40s, in fact, all the way to the 1960s, for 100 years, they were trying to return blacks to their previous condition of servitude. While in the post-Civil War South, those who supported black rights put their lives in danger. Preaching after a lynching, Turner pointed to whites standing in the back and declared, not only do you act like dogs, you are dogs. The black congregation feared for his safety. They carried him to a tree in the woods. He spent the night there, listening to the hound dogs howl. Bishop Payne called Turner the bravest man in Georgia and encouraged him to enter politics. Ministers and churches staked out different positions when it came to dealing with their former masters. Some chose to worship under the paternalistic eyes of Southern whites, others in integrated congregations. Some worshiped independently, while others submitted to a black church hierarchy. They figured once America's turned this corner, the promised land's down the road. Maybe America's gonna act right, because it's got great potential. The whole world's looking on America. This is the grand city on the hill, the moral example of the globe. And black folks say, good God, especially these black ministers, I think if we join forces, we can create a democracy, a multiracial democracy. They called it political reconstruction. Throughout the South, over a hundred black ministers won election to legislative seats. In 1868, Turner became one of 31 blacks elected to the Georgia State House. His work actually transcended the stained glass windows of the church. He was actually a politician, actually being elected to office in Georgia. His picture stands today uh, in the Georgia State House of Representatives in Atlanta. As he began his term, Turner hoped for a political coalition with the Confederates. We want to treat them kindly and live in friendship. Yet I must say, as I believe, that as soon as old things can be forgotten, all things become common, that the Southern people will take us by the hand and welcome us to their respect and regard. No sooner had he taken his place along with those other black representatives in the legislature than the white forces, whether Democrat or Republican, combined to force the black legislators out of the legislature. It would be 1965 before blacks regained access to the Georgia State House. And then, again, whites forced the most outspoken member out. I remember the last time, I think it was, that Negroes sat in this body was in 1868, if I'm not mistaken. They were expelled. The last time I tried to watch what was going on in this body, I was expelled. I had knocked on the doors, I'd kissed the babies, I'd shaken the hands, I'd competed against someone in the primary, I'd done everything right. I'd won the election, and now these white men are telling them they've got to make some other choice. In 1867, as white politicians voted to expel all the black legislators, Turner had lost faith in a multiracial democracy. Am I not a man? because I happen to be of a darker hue than honorable gentlemen around me? Bishop Turner had been where I was. He had sat in the legislature with these overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly rural, overwhelmingly conservative segregationists. And so he and I sat in the same place, and I imagine experienced some of the same things. And it was so good to know that before me, there had been somebody there 
who was a real man who stood up, who shook his finger at the group. I assert that by the time you take off the mucus pigment, the color of the skin, you cannot, to save your life, distinguish between the black man and the white. Because God saw fit to make some red, some white, and some black and some brown, are we to sit here in judgment upon what God has seen fit to do? As well might one play with the thunderbolts of heaven than with that creature that bears God's image. Congress heard their appeal, but responded too late. Alone, the expelled legislators faced white reprisals. After we were expelled from the legislature, I went home to Jasper County. I was carrying a farm there. At about 2 o'clock, my wife woke me up and said there was persons all around the house. I asked them what they wanted. They said the dogs had treed something and that they needed a light. They asked me to come out. And at this time, my brother-in-law waked up. He said I would get up and give them a light. He put on his shoes, his vest, and his hat. That was all he was fine with after he was killed. They came to my house and broke my door open, took me out of my bed, and took me to the woods and whipped me. They gave me 400 or 500 licks before they commenced counting. Political organizers like Turner faced a more public punishment. He was appointed as a postmaster, a political job, in Macon, Georgia. But the combination of, of white Republicans and Democrats um, forced him out of that position with accusations of mishandling funds and so forth, which were totally fictitious. That really wasn't the most damaging allegation in the court of public opinion. It was his extramarital involvement that was the thing that really tended to stick in people's minds that greatly damaged Turner, among many in the AME Church, including Bishop Payne, who uh, felt AME ministers had damaged the cause by combining the gospel with politics during Reconstruction. Outraged, Payne condemned his protege. It seemed Turner might lose everything he had worked so hard to attain. I've had to pass through blood and fire. No man can imagine what I've had to endure, but one who has gone through it. Lesser men, uh, incidents like that would have almost destroyed their political and ecclesiastical careers. But uh, Turner was very focused. He had to have a strong faith. Uh, with a weak faith in God, uh, Turner would have left the ministry, would have left the political arena, would have given up. Slavery and oppression provides a wilderness experience where people raise ultimate questions. They're on the brink and on the breaking point. And at that particular special place between sanity and insanity, breaking and not, is where I think God encounters us best. And I think at that point, either you break or you get the sense that there's no need to break, that it's a matter of, and I think that a lot of blacks got the sense that, that, that there was no need to break. Turner left Macon and settled in Savannah. There, he helped build a network of black Methodist and Baptist churches. We want power. It only comes through unity. Our efforts must be one and inseparable blended, tied, and bound together. Glory and honor, glory and honor, ain't got time to die. All of the different multifaceted things that Henry McNeil Turner did has really resonated with me. He had a strong spirituality, but at the same time, he had a vibrant social outreach ministry. And uh, we don't see a lot of that today. I think when you look at televangelists today in the African-American community, uh, they are basically lifting individual piety without social responsibility. 
And Henry McNeil Turner did both of those things well. He was able to be concerned about church growth and development, and at the same time really be concerned about the souls of people. You must understand that the church served as the center of the meeting gathering place, and it's the only time that we got together because even in my boyhood, people worked from sunup to sundown, and you were trying to make out of the land or out of the water subsistence to take care of yourself and your family. But the Bible had taught us that the seventh day